Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Would you please take your Bibles and open them to the book of Hebrews chapter 9? Hebrews chapter 9 is where we are in a Bible study that I've entitled Forgiveness of Sin is Costly and Valuable. The forgiveness of sin is costly and valuable. Now, as we study through the book of Hebrews, remember it's a pastor's responsibility to take the timeless truths of the scripture and make them relevant for the present day. You'll never really be able to understand the Bible until you understand what it meant to the people that it was written to. So while the Bible is indeed written to you and me today, in order to understand what it means for us today, we need to understand what it meant to those that received it. In the case of Hebrews, remember the context of this book is that it was written to a group of Jewish Christians who had left the formality of the Old Covenant, or what we refer to as the Law, and they embrace faith in Jesus Christ, which we know as the new covenant. The problem is, is that they're a place of struggle right now. They're at a place of difficulty because they're missing the formalities of the past and they are wrestling with the simplicity of the present. Even though everything they learned in the old covenant, all the tabernacle worship, all the sacrifices, all the way into the temple, all pointed toward the coming of Jesus Christ so that when you embrace Jesus, you have it all, but they have family and friends. They have a lifestyle, just like you. You could probably relate in some way. Uh, Those of you that don't like change of any kind, you know, that's what they say. The people that research these things say, you know, most people don't like change uh, and, and they wrestle against it and they fight against it. But the one constant that's in our life, ironically, is change. Things are changing, times are changing, culture is changing. It seems like everything's changing around us. And if we become rigid and inflexible, then the changers are just going to break us and snap us. But for them, it was significant because they were losing their family. They were losing their friends and they wanted to go backwards. And what Paul does in Hebrews is he writes to them very detailed about the significance of how Jesus is better than anything they've ever experienced. Even to the point where you could say Jesus is the best. So that today, by your faith in Jesus Christ, you have come to the best place in your life. There's no greater than faith in Jesus Christ. There's no greater hope. There's no greater strength. There's no greater help than faith in Jesus Christ. And today, in chapter 9, as we finish the chapter, it's one of those challenging chapters. And you that have been with us, you know that Hebrews is a challenging book. It is taking me much more time to study through Hebrews to get to the root of the matter than just about any other book. Probably the only other book that was more challenging or equally challenging was the book of Romans as I was studying to prepare it because you want to get to the root of it of what God is teaching us now. And as we've gone through it, you're here today, you go, man, Ed, that's a pretty heavy stuff, you know. I show up to church for the very first time and you're in the midst of Hebrews and all, talking about blood and sin and everything. And I just, but you have to understand, you've walked into a church that goes through the Bible verse by verse. So although you might be here the first week today, we actually, this is our 43rd Bible study in the book of Hebrews. So I suggest you go back and catch up. All 43 are on our web and you can build up. And, you know, it's a 43 hours of time, but you would catch up to where we are or even just go back five or six. But, you know, definitely when you're studying a book of the Bible, you want to get the introduction. So you can go all the way back to the beginning and you can study as much as you want because this book fits within the panorama of the fullness of God's word. And while you jump in, you'll know that the next time we'll start in chapter 10 and we'll work our way through until we finish the entire book. So pick up with me where we left off. In verse 15 of Hebrews chapter 9. And for this reason, he, now you can notice in your Bible that's probably capitalized because it's a reference to Jesus Christ. He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 
For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, if you want to understand this a little bit better, circle the word testament and just right next to it, will. Because we even use that phrase today. When you develop a will, a will is going to de- declare to you what you want done after you die. We usually call it the last will and testament. So that's where he's at right here. That's why the word's being used here. He's using that word to describe the significance of why Jesus' death is so important. Because the new covenant was there, but not in force until someone dies. So what he's saying here in, these, in a very simple way is that when Jesus Christ died, he instituted the new covenant. I'm reminded of my, of my parents. My parents are both in heaven now, and my, my dad preceded my mom. And so when my mom passed away, I was the executor of my mom's and dad's estate, which wasn't much, but I was the executor of all that they worked for for their lives. And the moment my mom passed away was the moment that will became important. It became important until my mom passed away. It was just a piece of paper in a folder in a filing cabinet. But once it passed away, we pulled it out, we submitted it to the court, and for over two years, we had to go through the whole probate system to make sure everything that my mom desired was taken care of. And so here's what he's saying. The will, the new covenant, was just sitting there waiting to be put in force until someone died. And once Jesus died, the new covenant started then. And it's vital for the Hebrews, and it's vital for you to understand. When the new covenant began, the old covenant ended. It had a beginning and an end, which is significant for you to realize because there are still people today that will come to you and require you to keep the law. They will require you to keep the Torah. They'll require you, are you, do you keep everything that's in the Old Testament? And they have failed to understand that the Old Covenant was replaced by the New Covenant. You don't have two at the same time. The New Covenant came through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he notice he says, not only is he the mediator of this New Covenant, verse 15, but he's also the executor. Jesus not only gives us, not only is he the testator, not only is the mediator, but he's the the executor of the new covenant. Why? Because he's the best. He's the better. Nothing, you need nothing and no one more than faith in Jesus Christ. The problem that's hard for us is we didn't enter into the new covenant from the old system. We don't have the old, we didn't come to the temple. We didn't go through the uh, sacrificial system. We never brought an animal to be sacrificed for us. So we came in on this side of the cross, but they have both. They have before and after, and they're struggling with it. Notice verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood, which is now we get to the essence of this section of scripture, the importance of blood. We... He says, for when Moses had spoken every precept, verse 19, to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then, likewise, he sprinkled the blood, both tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And, according to the law, Almost all things are purged with blood. And you might want to mark this in your Bibles. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So going back and forth between the old covenant and the new He refers to the old covenant here as the law, and he says, look, the law had an inauguration ceremony. Moses took blood and spread it on the law. He spread it on the people. He spread it on the tabernacle because the institution of the old covenant, it had a beginning. But it also had an end. The beginning of the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, came with Moses, but it it ended at the cross. Beginning and end. The shedding of Jesus' blood was the end of the old system and the beginning of the new covenant, even as now Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary sprinkled his blood on mankind. Now, 
Blood is very significant in the Bible. Now, I don't think you'd disagree. Blood is very significant in the practical realm. Like, your, the blood in your body is very important to your life. Do you guys realize that? It's very important. As a matter of fact, in trauma training, one of the things they will t- teach you is make sure the airway is clear, and if there's any wound, stop the bleeding. Don't let it bleed out. That would be the worst, one of the worst things that can happen. Stop the bleeding, give some compression, check the airway, check the breathing, check the compressions to make sure everything's taken care of because, and again, I know this is elementary and simple, but the elementary and simple things are often ignored. So you already grasp, and I'm sharing with you for the point of you already grasp the significance of blood in the human body. You may not always think about it, but you realize the blood is very, very, very important. Well, blood in the Bible is also very important. So it's important practically, but it's also important spiritually. And you'll find that many people are taken back. It's very offensive, this issue of blood. And, and a lot of people don't understand. You know, you're talking about your relationship with God and you go, oh yeah, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed me from all sin. Are you covered with the blood? It's the blood of God, that, the blood that washes us and makes me white as snow. And people go, dude, what are you talking about? What does that mean? Blood this and blood that and why the blood? Well, that's a good question to ask. And it's a good question to answer in people's lives. It's important to understand the significance of blood when it comes to God's perspective. So let's ask ask and answer the question. The real question that remains is why? Why is blood so important to God? If you're taking notes, let me give you three reasons. Number one, blood is important to God and it's important to his system of being saved and having your your sins forgiven because God instituted it that way. And that's important to remember. One reason that God has made blood so important is he, this is his way. This is God's way. It's vital that we learn and remember that everything begins and ends with God. And I would dare say that some of the issues in this room today, some of the issues that are in people's lives that are connected with us by technology, some of the issues in your life are simply because you have failed to put God first and last in your life. You have failed to obey God. You have failed to acknowledge God. You have failed to remember that He is the author of your life, that you're accountable to Him. It's not a theory. It's not education. You are accountable to your Creator. If you were to open the Bible, the very first thing the Bible says is the most important thing to grasp in your life, and it's this. In the beginning, God. But when God is no longer the beginning the middle or the end, life loses meaning and substance. And you're stuck with an empty shell of what life could be. Why blood? Well, because God instituted it that way. This is his system of belief. He is our author. He granted us life. We are accountable to him. And so when he says blood's important, our response is, I believe you, God. I believe you. I trust you. I I understand that blood's significant to you. I mean, it's been that way all throughout the Bible. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. In Hebrews chapter 9, as we saw here in verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There's no remission of sin. You're stuck without the blood. Let me give you another one, number two. Why blood? Why is blood so important to God? Well, God used blood to emphasize the gravity and the weight of sin. Sin is very important to understand and recognize in your life. It's really too bad that many churches today, you could walk in and out of church for year after year and never hear about the weight of sin and the problem that sin is in your life and mine. Sin is a big deal, church. It's a huge deal. You know, whatever you came in here with today, whatever issue is heavy on your heart, maybe you're grieving, maybe you're bewildered, maybe you're fearful, maybe you've got an, a work issue you don't know, maybe you're hopeless, it, whatever it might be, let me tell you, that is not your biggest issue. Your biggest issue is what are you going to do with the sin that's in your life? What will you do? 
And you say, well, Ed, I don't really believe I'm a sinner. So you've chosen not to acknowledge that. I don't, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm all that bad. I don't think I'm that bad at all. You might even respond when you hear a pastor or preacher talk about sin. You might even respond, you know, Ed, I'm a good person. Can I just acknowledge right now, you probably are a really good person. Thank you. Thank you for being good. I, I think our culture needs a lot, of, a lot more good people than bad people. Would you get an amen on that? Thanks for being good. I'm glad that you're good. May your tribe increase. I know for many years I could characterize my dad that way. He was a very good man. He was a very moral, upright man. But he was disconnected from God. You see, my dad, as good as he was and as moral and upright as he was, he had a sin problem. And so do you. You go, wait a minute, Ed, what is, I don't, it doesn't make sense. How can I have a sin problem and be good at the same time? Well, it all has to do with who you measure, how you measure goodness. So that when you think of goodness, you think of a few good deeds that you do and you help somebody across the street and you helped your neighbor and you have a burden, you know, when you hear things on the news and, and you, you're, you're just a force for good in society. And when you compare yourself to other people, you know, you think, well, I'm better than them and I'm more good than they are and that's great. But the problem with that is that when it comes to your life before God, you and I, we can only compare ourselves to one person, <laughs> Right? Here's what, here's what God says. God says, in order to live in relationship with me, you must be perfect. Now, I haven't met too many people, and that, that none, none that can even come to my mind right now, that look me in the eye and say, I am perfect. I haven't met too many people like that. I mean, maybe, just because my memory is not good, maybe I have, but I haven't met anyone that would, as a matter of fact, if I can get you talking and examining your life, I'm certain that I could get you to admit that you've made mistakes in your life. Like maybe you've, let's just say you've stolen something. I say, hey, hey man, have you ever stolen anything? And you're like, yeah, maybe back in kindergarten I took that crayon and I never gave it back. I left it in my pocket, then mom washed the clothes and it ruined the whole load of laundry. Ah, you sinned. What? Taking a crayon, I sinned? Yeah, you were a little kindergartner sinner back then, yes. That crayon, crayon was not yours. Well, you know, I haven't stolen anything since then. Well, good, good, good. But you can't undo the thievery, can you? So that one episode of stealing, well, what does that make you? It makes you a thief. Or have you ever told a lie? Have you ever been dishonest? And I'm certain as we're walking through life, you go, yeah, I've kind of told a little white lie there. And, and so if you've ever lied in your life, what does that make you? A liar. You go, Ed, you're not making me feel real good right now. But that's not the intent. I just want to be real with you. I'm here to tell you the truth. And while I'm not giving you a banner over your life, I am showing you something. And that is what you think are mistakes, God calls sin. But they're even greater than mistakes, greater than taking some crayon or saying something out of your mouth. When you and I sin, we have failed a holy and righteous God who is utterly perfect, who gave you and me life so that we might enjoy a relationship with him and be a force for good, not just in our moral standards, but in God's righteous standards. And so if you find yourself having failed in life, then you have failed to be at that perfect requirement of God. But the good news is this. The good news is, is that what God requires, he provides. What God requires, he provides in the new covenant. And he provides it through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What does the shed blood of Jesus Christ mean? Well, listen, 2,000 years ago, God came to the earth in the form of a human being. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the promised Savior of the world. And he lived approximately 33 years into adulthood. The final three years of the life of Jesus was spent loving, caring, healing, feeding, and sharing the truth of God's word, going against, he would even teach against the religious establishment and those that were taking advantage of people. And the reward for perfect life, the reward, you know Jesus, you know what his reward was? He was lied about, he was slandered. They even hired people to testify against him so that he was found guilty in a Roman court of law and viciously beaten. Do you know that Jesus Christ was beaten so bad that there's an old King James phrase that says his visage was marred. 
And that means today that he was so badly maimed that unless you knew who he was, you wouldn't have recognized him. And they took him after lashing. They called that a scourging. If you've ever been to a Good Friday service in a church, Good Friday is a day in memorial of that day of beating and scourging. It was a horrific way to be treated. Torture. We would call that today torture. They torture him and beat him bloody, blood, real blood out of a real human body. But it didn't end there. They took him after the scourging and they hung him on a Roman torture cross. And he died of crucifixion. And he bled. And that significance of the blood of Jesus Christ is spoken of here. Why blood? To magnify the weight of sin. Sin is serious. Sin is a serious matter. It is not to be messed with. I like how Pastor John Corson writes in his commentary. Let me quote it to you. Why is God so deadly serious about sin? It's not because he's prudish. Not because he can't handle violence or sex. It's because he knows what sin does. Sin kills. It kills happiness. It kills joy. It kills health. It kills life. It kills kids and families and societies and cultures. That's why the only way that there can be forgiveness is by the shedding of blood. There's no such thing as forgiveness light. Forgiveness only comes through the blood. For the Hebrew believers, they know this. They would see every time the priest would bring the animal and slit the animal's throat and watch the blood flow, that they would be reminded that sin brings death. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 6. Sin, the wages of sin is always death. And God takes it seriously. You know, the mathematics of sin are always the same. I don't know where I got this from, but I'm gonna quote it from some own unknown guy or gal, I don't know. But listen, the mathematics are always the same. Sin will add to your sorrow, subtract your joy, multiply your problems, and divide your heart. It will always do damage to you and me. Sin is rooted in the hearts of every human being. And let me just set the record straight. When we speak of sin, we use the word we. Because the Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There isn't anyone among us today that is innocent in the eyes of God. We have all sinned. And when we think of blood, it magnifies the weight of sin. Let me give you one final one, number three. And that is, why blood? Well, number one, God instituted it, so he's the beginning, he's the source, he's the center of our life. Number two, it magnifies the weight and significance of sin, the weightiness. And then thirdly, it magnifies the cost and the value of forgiveness. Can I just say it magnifies your value, how important you are to God. Some of you came in here today, you don't think you're very important. You don't think you have a future. You don't think your life matters. When you think of the blood of Jesus Christ, friend, your life matters. You know the Bible says that God loves you. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. So that if you place your faith in him today, your sins will be forgiven. You'll be brought into a right relationship with God. You think of it. God loves me. Yeah, God loves you. And you say, well, prove it to me then, pastor. Well, I, I don't need to, but I can point you to the proof. And that is the proof of God's love for you is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where it's at. You're so valuable that your life has been measured by the life and death of Jesus Christ himself. Forgiveness only comes through the blood because it's costly, because you're valuable. Our forgiveness is valuable. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Precious. Because you know, in our culture, all kinds of things are precious. People value stuff all the time. You know, I guess, I guess the number one thing that we value in our culture is the almighty buck and dollars. You know, get as many dollars as you can, as fast as you can, and hide it away and tuck it away for retirement until you just protect it with all money, 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 money. That's a big deal in our culture. And, and maybe, maybe not money so much now, because with the, cult, the way that our economy is, you realize our economy is based on promises. So paper, paper is just a promise. And, and so what you'll see is a lot of commercials now. Here, I, I, there's, there's difficulty in the economy, so you know what you need to buy? You need to buy gold. 
and you need to amass gold. Go get your gold. Sometimes there's a silver commercial, but the silver's lame. Get gold. <laughs> get some gold and amass the gold because gold is the most precious, most costly, most important thing in the world. So yeah, you might have a lot of money, but make sure your portfolio is diversified and you got a lot of gold and a lot of gold and a lot of gold. Do you know the Bible values things differently than the world? Do you know that? The Bible doesn't look down on money. It doesn't look down on gold. The Bible just teaches us there are things more precious and more valuable than gold. So that even if you have a lot of gold or a little gold today, the value in your life is the same. <laughs> Whether you're very rich today because God's blessed you or you're very poor because that's where God has you, the value in your life, we're all equal. Whether you're super happy today and things are going exactly the way you want them or you're super sad and you're just about ready to be done with life, your value is the same at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because there are things more valuable than gold according to the Bible. Let me give you a couple. Number one, let me tell you something. Wisdom is more valuable than gold, the Bible says. Wisdom. Imagine that. Wisdom. Wisdom from God is more valuable than gold which is really encouraging for us because wisdom is cheap to get. It's inexpensive. The price for God's wisdom is free. It's free. And so where do you find wisdom? In God's word. And you're here, well, bet I've read the Bible. I don't know that I'm very wise. Well, let me make it easier for you if you're looking for wisdom. Let me make it easier for you. Start reading the Proverbs. The Proverbs in the Bible, which is about halfway in the middle of your Bible, is the book of wisdom. I mean, the whole book Bible is, is wisdom, but Proverbs is specifically wisdom. And Proverbs is broken down into 31 chapters, which is really cool because most months have 30, 31 days, and you can read a chapter of Proverbs every day. So that if you read a chapter of Proverbs every day, by the end of the year, you have 365 doses of God's wisdom. And wisdom from God is far more valuable than gold. You are a richer man and a richer woman with the wisdom of God. Let me give you another one. Psalm, that was Job 28 verse 15, by the way. Another thing that's more valuable than gold in Psalm 19 is God's word. And it's called the law, the testimony, his precepts. This is more valuable. God's word is more valuable than gold. And imagine just, just all the effort and all the energy that goes into going after money, going after gold, which is fine. You know, that, that's how God's made you. That's what you're doing. Great. But man, God's word is just waiting to be mined like a, like a gold mine. It's full of commandments. And this is where a pastor, you know, uh, I, read, I, I read things in a different world like you probably do for your uh, employment. And I'm in the church world. I'm reading a lot of things about Christians in the church world and one of the most discouraging things that I come across probably every month or so is they do a survey and the survey almost always says that very few people read their Bible. Very few Christians read their Bible. Very few churchgoers read their Bible. What that means is very few of you read your Bible, which is pretty discouraging. It's discouraging for me to think of all the potential that's in this room, but you're not going after it. You don't really desire to go after it. You're just not in a place where you want, that, that, that's so discouraging. It's not because, you know, it's not some heavy trip or read your Bible to be good Christians. No, like it's more valuable than gold. So go after it. Go after it and see what God has for you. See what God has for you in encouragement. See what God has for you in love. See what God has for you to give you direction in life in wisdom and help and hope and a reminder of a heavenly hope. I mean, on and on and on. It's more precious. Let me give you a couple more that's more precious than gold. Well, let me give you three more. Let me give you four more. This is second service. We'll be here all day. <laughs> the commandments of God, the Bible says, are more precious than gold. Psalm 119, verse 27. The fruit that comes from wisdom. So it's not just having wisdom, but how everything that comes when you walk in wisdom is more precious than gold. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17 through 19. Let, let me add one more. You can jot it down. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. You know what's more precious than gold? The genuineness of your faith. How does the genuineness of your faith shine? Through trials, verse 6. Do you know the genuineness of your faith is more valuable than gold? You can't buy faith. You can't buy salvation. You can't buy hope. Because what God gives to you is more precious. It's more valuable than gold. You couldn't have enough gold in the world to buy 
what you're looking for. Because you know what happens? Instead of looking for things that are more precious than gold, people turn to the bottle. I did that for many years. People turn to drugs, and now more and more drugs are being legal, so they're in more people's systems. And it's like, oh, that must be more precious than gold. That's all junk, man. It's going to destroy you. Whether it's a, a, a joint that you're smoking or a line that you're snorting or a needle in your arm, it's going to kill you. And before it kills you, it's killing everyone that loves you. Because it's not going to lead you to where you want. God gives you forgiveness that will free you from all the things that you're wrestling with. Not only that, let me give you one more thing that's more precious than gold. You ready? You ready? You guys with me? You are more precious than gold. You. Your life. You in your current state are more precious than gold. You're more valuable than the most valuable treasure on the earth today. That God, when he sent his son to die, he didn't die for animals, didn't die for gold, didn't die for money, didn't die for career. He died for you. So the value of your life, the value of your kiddos, the value of your grandkids is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And this is where it gets important. Because our culture will tell you in times of trouble, our culture will tell you, you know what? Here's the solution to your problem. You need to go find yourself. You need to go find yourself. Really? I need to go find myself. Well, let me help you with that, just in case that's where you're at right now. You go, Ed, that's the counsel my psychologist has told me. I need to find myself. Okay, let me help you out. I'm going to save you some time. Are you ready? You're right there. <laughs> what? Yeah, you've got to go find yourself? Yes, where am I? You're right there. But you know it's much deeper than that. What we're trying to address is, what's trying to be addressed is you come to this midlife crisis, you, you come to this fork in the road, you come to this difficulty, you come to this sorrow, and you're like, what am I supposed to do? I'm hurting so bad. What am I supposed to do? I'm struggling so much. Who am I? And you know what happens? When you start looking for yourself, all you're going to find is an empty mess, and it only gets worse and worse, and it's this circle and cycle of self, self, self. In times of crisis, you don't need yourself. You need someone greater than yourself to deliver you from your hopeless situation. That's the truth of God. The last thing you need in crisis is yourself. And so alongside with that is they'll say, well, you know, here's your problem. You need to build up your self-esteem. That's really what you need. You need to build up your self-esteem. But Jesus said the exact opposite. And we want to follow the teachings of Jesus. Let me show you. Turn over to Matthew chapter 16 as we wind down today. Matthew chapter 16. So you've got to see this in your own Bible. This is, this is the, the teaching of a faithful, loving Savior. And this is what he tells us. Matthew chapter 16. Can I say while you're turning, I want to acknowledge the issue of self-esteem for a moment because I don't want to dismiss it so flippantly or quickly because I know what that word is referring to. It's referring to a sense of emptiness in your life. It's referring to a sense of pain. It's referring to a sense of feeling devalued or yeah, like maybe somebody put you down or maybe as you were growing up, your mom and dad were mean or maybe you, you're the kind of person that always put yourself down. And, and you've got real feelings of inferiority and you've got real feelings of, of worthlessness. Um, I acknowledge those in your life. That, that's true. You have those feelings and you're wrestling with them. But the way this world, the culture works, the idea to help you build up yourself is actually going to hurt you more. Because then your life will no longer be centered on God. It will only be centered on yourself. And you can only keep up the charade for so long. You can only put so many post-it notes around the house. Today is going to be a good day. Today is it's a good day. You know, the roof is caved in, but it's a good day. My car got ripped off. Praise the Lord. No, it's not fun to get your car ripped off or to have a big gaping hole in your roof. But it's a good day. Love yourself. And then you wake up in the mirror and it says, I love you. Well, who wrote that? You did. So it's only your love. I love you. I love you. You're just talking to yourself. You need something outside of yourself. The post-it notes aren't going to change your life. Only Jesus Christ can change your life from the inside out. Not a bunch of phrases, not a bunch of, like, like everything we've sought after leaves us empty. This is what Jesus said. You got to listen to him. Verse 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him 
deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what man is it profited if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's the truth. If you're running after finding yourself, you're going to lose it all. But when you finally come to that place where you're just like, hey, I've come to the end of myself, God meets you there. God meets you there. And he's ready to esteem you because he has. You see, I guess you could add number four. I don't have it on my list, but I guess you can. Why blood? Because blood will always be associated with the esteem of God in your life. That's how much he loves you. A very life-flowing liquid in your body reminds you day after day of God's love for you. And you are surrounded in this room. You're surrounded outside of this room by people that have been touched and been changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's possible. Even the most hopeless situation is possible. Forgiveness is valuable. You are valuable. And your out value has everything to do with outside of you, not inside of you. It's what God has done and what he's doing on behalf of you. So let's come back to Hebrews 9. We'll finish out the chapter. Just a couple other truths I want to lay before you before we head out. It says in verse 23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now... Once at the end of the ages, he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So basically, he's just comparing old and new, old and new. The old was every year. He had to sacrifice animals every year. And, and, and that has, he's just making the point that system has ended so that Jesus doesn't have to die multiple times. One time, he died once for the forgiveness of sins of others. And verse 27, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So just a simple little quiz here. It's appointed how many times for a man to die? He's going to die how many times? Now, there are a few exceptions, of course. You know, this, isn't, this is a spiritual statement, not a physical statement. So in some cases, there might be the stoppage of a heart and they bring somebody back to life. That's not what he's speaking of here. He's also not even speaking about that one generation <laughs> that won't taste death <laughs> at the rapture of the church that in a twinkling of eye somebody told me after service the twinkling of an eye is the speed of light that ta ta the time it takes for, the, for a, a beam of light to bounce off your eye and I said I'm sure there's some physicist in here that knows exactly well guess what he came up after service and he told me 186,000 feet a second is the speed of light now I hope I quoted that correctly but I don't know about you that sounds fast to me and that's how fast the Lord's going to come back for his church. Faster than a, you know, I'm doing this, but it's way faster than that. That's how, that's how eager we're waiting, like, Lord, take us. But see, when it's pointed once for a man to die, then the judgment, that answers a lot of questions. First of all, number one, it says there's no such thing as purgatory. The Bible says there's no such thing. This is the time you have. You're not going to get a second chance after death where you kind of go to a place and wait and maybe things get better for you. It's appointed once for a man to die and the judgment. Number two, it tells us there's no such thing as reincarnation. Because after you die, you're going to face your maker. You're going to give account for your life. You're not going to come back as an ant, which would be kind of bummer, man. <laughs> or a cow or whatever. You're, going to come, you're not coming back that way. You're going to face God with your life and give account for your life. It, it also tells us that there isn't any such thing as soul sleep. There's no intermediary state. You die once, face the judge. Die once, face the judge. Which leads us to the number one question that pretty much, probably number one, we never really charted them, but probably the number one question that comes on the radio broadcast uh, when we do the live show is this. What happens to a person after they die? That's a great question to ask. You want to know the answer. It's not just what happens to a person after they die. You want to know this answer. What's going to happen to you after you die? Well, the Bible only gives two options. 
The Bible says that it's appointed once for a man to die and then you're going to face the judge. Or for the believer, the Bible says that once you're absent from the body, you're what? Present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's the answer. You, you will be present. Everything that you've ever wanted and desired will be fulfilled after your last breath on earth. You'll be reunited with all your loved ones that have gone before you, and that is it. That's the answer. A believer can only be found of one of two places, on earth or in the presence of the Lord. That's it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that tells us that according, as we're eagerly waiting for him, that heaven is not just a destination. Heaven is a motivation. It moves us. It encourages us. Paul's hope of heaven made his aim on earth to please God. Because God's down payment in us, that longing for heaven moves and motivates us to holy, righteous living right now. And for the believer, I hope you are a believer. I want to give you a chance right now to turn away from your sins and ask God to forgive you. Surrender your life as it is. You don't have to improve it. You don't have to make it better. You don't have to get out of the pit that you're in. You don't have to forsake all the junk that you're doing. If you just come to Jesus as you are, you will experience the fullness of his forgiveness. I know you might have been in other churches and other religious systems that tell you, change the outside, change the outside, change the outside, and then maybe God will be pleased with you. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible says, I'm going to change the inside, and then watch me change the outside. Just come as you are. Just come as you are. I want to invite you to do that. So, Father, I ask you, God, to do that work in our hearts as we head out of here today. Um, I know our, our country's sad. Our city might be sad. I know that the, there's a heaviness around us and among us. And, and how grieved you must be at what man does to man. And yet at the same time, in this very moment, you are reaching out and drawing people to yourself. You are offering the forgiveness of sin. You are reminding us of the power of the blood. You are teaching us about the value that's placed upon our lives. And for most of us here today, we're excited. We're happy. Thank you for changing our lives. But there are a few that need to come for the very first time. And if you're here today and you'd say, Ed, I need to get my life right with God. I want to experience the forgiveness of my sins and I'm going to ask you where you are. Would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you and encourage you in the most beautiful, wonderful decision you will ever make in your life. Just stand right where you're at. Let's get to business about your soul and that you would meet the Savior. God bless you guys that are here. God bless you in the back. Yes, on the radio, of course. On the internet, we don't see you because it's not like a two-way thing, but God sees you. Maybe downstairs, you guys are around the TVs downstairs and... Uh, perhaps God is moving on your heart. Let's do it. Let's respond. God bless you guys in the back. You too as well. Who else would say that's me? It's a very high and holy moment, church. So be in prayer. Pray for the battle of the souls of men right now and the souls of women and the souls of boys and girls. There's a battle to keep someone stuck, to keep them away from the God that loves them. But I have the privilege of declaring to you no one listening to me is outside the reach of God. No one. I don't care how bad you are or how bad things are. It doesn't matter. God's love covers it all. Is there anyone else? God bless you right here. I see you. So cool. It's a good thing. Faithfully moving among us. So the Bible says this, you guys that responded, the Bible says this, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I want to help you do that. I want to help you confess with the mouth. I want you uh, to enter into a prayer so you can repeat this after me because prayer is just talking to God. So it needs to come out of your mouth and it's a good thing. So even if you whisper it, just let it be. So you can remember, I fulfilled that, what it says in the Bible. So you could say to God something like this. You ready? Dear God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me, to shed his precious blood 
to forgive me of my sins. And I believe Jesus rose again from the dead and is alive today. And I commit my life to following him from this day forward. Help me, God, to renounce and turn away from my sins and to live my life fully for you. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. And the whole church says, Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.